Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, August 9th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, what's wrong with Hillary Clinton's health? As rumors begin to speculate across the internet, the mainstream media says it's all just a crazy conspiracy theory, and there's nothing wrong with Hillary Clinton. Meanwhile, medical experts disagree. I think the public has a right to know, number one. We're talking in 2008, Sean. I looked over a 1,000 pages of John McCain's records because of a melanoma he had had 10 years before. What about Hillary? Then, the magic of Photoshop turns a low turnout to a Hillary rally into a full house of energetic and enthusiastic supporters. And speaking of Hillary rallies, who the hell invited this guy? The father of the Orlando nightclub shooter is placed prominently behind Hillary Clinton during a campaign stop. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. While InfoWars is continuing to dominate the news cycle, we're having a massive effect on this election cycle. You guys should be very proud of yourselves out there. Now, one of our articles that's been at the top of the Drudge Report all day, I guarantee this story isn't going anywhere. Will Hillary disavow? When will she disavow? So the father of Omar Mateen, the gay nightclub mass murdering terrorist, was there to show his support at a Hillary Clinton rally. Okay, so this was a man who openly supports the Taliban, openly supports the extermination of gay people. He shows up at the Clinton rally and sat right behind her and was taking photos and videos. Uh, he also had a sign. Uh, later, a news, the newscast caught up with him and he was holding a sign, Clinton is good for the United States versus Donald Trump. <laughs> he also says that she'll be good for national security. So there you go. If you had any question about what Hillary's America looks like, it's like that, where you have a terrorist father sitting right behind Hillary Clinton. Good job there, Secret Service. Or was he purposefully planted there? More likely scenario. Uh, Joe Biggs and Ashley Beckford will be joining me in studio later to break this insanity down. But I mean, this is Hillary Clinton, who, of course, is looking for an endorsement from another terrorist war criminal, Henry Kissinger, who, of course, she calls her a friend who she relied on his counsel when she served as Secretary of State. Of course, uh, the war criminal Kissinger has said that Hillary Clinton ran the State Department better than anybody had run it in a long time. So those are just two peas in a pod. Uh, but here's another story that we have forced out into the mainstream. And rather than debunking it, rather than putting out her medical records to prove that she is in a great state of health, uh, all they're trying to do is tear down our reporting. So here's a story out of the Daily Beast. Is the Hillary dying hoax started by a pal of Alex Jones. <laughs> yes, our star investigative reporter there, Paul Joseph Watson, is just a, an old pal of Alex Jones. So he starts his article off by Hillary Clinton supposedly has Parkinson's disease, syphilis, brain damage, a brain tumor, autism, a degenerative disease, giving her seizures and strokes, a blood clot, and oh, also Paul, Paul Joseph Watson says she has a drug problem. So you can already see the slant of this article, where this thing is going. Uh, this writer just continues on trying to immediately paint Paul Joseph Watson as a conspiracy theorist. It's so crazy. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about how Fox News's Sean Hannity devoted a section of his program to the rumors of Hillary's bad health last night. CNN's Jeffrey Lord doubled down on national TV, saying Donald Trump is willing to point out other things people have been pointing out for years when asked about Clinton's health. And then he goes on to write about the fact that writers like Watson is just too popular. He has got all of these YouTube subscribers, half a million subscribers. He sometimes, of course, hosts the Alex Jones radio show. And he's too powerful. Watson's reach is just too powerful. How dare he question Hillary's health? So this is just amazing because out of this four page article, he doesn't bother to debunk Paul Joseph Watson's claims, nor does, does he go into any investigative reporting of his own. He's just there to run interference for Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. Now, last night on Fox News, Sean Hannity did set up this photo that's causing the big stir with Hillary Clinton having to be helped up the stairs. He said, 
uh, talking about this picture, he said earlier today, we reached out to the Clinton campaign for a statement and a spokesman told us that the Drudge Report is shameful and anyone who buys into that medical condition, shameful. But what was missing was a statement about the health issues. So everyone's just shameful. How dare you? You know, you should be ashamed of yourself for daring to question the health of a woman that you were going to put into the most powerful position in the United States. How dare you? And then, of course, Dr. Mark Siegel said that the public has a right to know. And of course, we do have a right to know if Hillary has some sort of a health condition that is going to um, inhibit her from running the country if she is elected. Now, we also spoke with another medical expert today who indeed said the public has a right to know. This is Dr. Steve Pachenik. Now, he is a doctor, PhD, an American psychiatrist, and a former U.S. Department of State official. So he spoke with Alex Jones earlier today about Hillary's current health and, of course, the cover-up. Well, I certainly think that a traumatic brain injury with symptoms down the road is very, very likely here, especially since she had a blood clot on her brain. And as David was mentioning, that can actually lead to a seizure problem. We need to see her records to see mm -hmm. what's the sequela well, they want that Donald Trump's tax the brain. There's two things we want from her. We want her speeches to Wall Street and the medical records in full. I demand that she have an independent medical neurological evaluation by people who are neither Republicans nor Democrats to evaluate her mental status and physical status to be the president of the United States. Is she unfit to be the nominee? At this point, yes. Dr. Pachinik, again, um, you have treated world leaders, treated U.S. leaders, that's yes. all on record. Board certifying psychiatrist, MD, uh, former head of psychological warfare for the State Department, uh, you know, a guy that ran entire medical facilities, probably the best person in the world to talk to on this. I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can ask somebody, hey, do you have Parkinson's disease? Yes, I do. I mean, I can see when someone looks like they have a neurological disorder or a Parkinson's type, you know, spectrum or whatever. You as a truly educated expert, six months, a few years ago, disappearing into this brain tumor specialist facility, uh, all the bizarre behavior, uh, her obviously degenerating, acting so angry, uh, looking disoriented, having many seizures, uh, looking at her, just in the videos you see online, if you saw that of a lay person, what would you say is wrong with them? I would say that she has a, a cold brain, uh, brain tumor, either glioblastoma, or that she has possibly an onset of Alzheimer's disease, which begins as what we would call a subcortical vascular dementia. Uh, uh, because of thrombosis to the brain. Either way, it has to be ruled out. If she has early onset uh, dementia, which she may well have, which came out in the issue with Chris Wallace and her, her quick discussion as a short circuit, and then Kane, Kane her uh, vice president, took over, it, it clearly said to me, that Hillary at this point is not qualified physically, mentally, or emotionally to be the president of the United States unless she is given a clean record of health, which I doubt will happen. What we've seen is a lot of distraction of a group of her people, including Republicans who may or may not have been co-opted, to say that Trump is impulsive, he's erratic. In fact, the reality is that's a lot of distortion and distraction which belongs to her. And in time... Well, I've actually found Trump is super disciplined and is just like a, a workhorse and very, very calm and focused uh, in, in private. And then that's what folks that know him Correct. say. Correct. I'm not here. I don't want to get into politics, but let's make it very clear. There is no history that I know about Trump where he has actually killed individuals Intentionally or unintentionally. Her history. Yeah, Trump hasn't gone around and destabilized all these countries and said, Correct. I came, I saw, he died. Correct. Now, we can honestly say her judgment about Libya is in question. Was it her judgment because she thought that was the best thing to do? Or did she have an underlying psychological, neurological problem which compelled her to act and be aggressive? and go to war, as she did in Iraq and elsewhere. Well, that was now, my next question, because you are a top uh, psychiatrist. Let me expand on that. A lot of times you read about dementia, you read about uh, brain tumors. People tend to start acting like kids. They tend to have rages. They tend to get aggressive. In a lot of videos, 
I thought it was just her acting like a kid for her audience, but more and more, I see her on C-SPAN and things off to the side, acting like a little kid, uh, but also kind of raging and stomping around. Uh, what is that indicative of, Doctor? It's indicative of onset of possibly dementia. A dementia, in her case, would not be unusual because she's 69 years old, going on 70. With all due respect to her, she's been under a lot of stress. She's flown all over the world. She has been dehydrated, but she has a, 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 she has a well-known history of having concussions. Not just one concussion, but concussions in 1998, 2009, and a major concussion in 2012 where she had to wear the Fresno prisms, which means that she has an ongoing post-concussion syndrome and or a glioblastoma or an onset of dementia or all three. But without an independent evaluation, without the release of the records from Columbia, not from this Dr. Lewis Bardak, I don't know who she is. And I, I, no, I understand. I release the real medical records. Why was she disappeared for a year, six months in treatment? That's not blood clots. No, that is far more serious than a blood clot. There's call for release of a full medical record. At the same time, I would want Congress to call in the Secret Service to demand exactly what they had witnessed what they have seen under oath. What are you injecting her with? There should be congressional hearings. Why does a person follow her and, with, and with a tranquilizer dart? They won't do that because it'll look partisan. But at the same time, I would put a gag order on everyone who's involved in any way in adding ad hominem comments. I mean, the fact that 50 Republican uh, ex-experts, all of whom were neocon, zealot go, you have uh, Zelik. Who no, I get it. You don't want political points. You care about the republic. I don't care about the political points. I care about the mental health and the medical health of this woman, and it has to be addressed ASA. Is she unfit to be the nominee? At this point, yes. Fifty Republican national security strategists came out against Trump on Monday saying we will never vote for him. Now, these were 50 Bush era national security strategists. Uh, they declared none of us will vote for Donald Trump from a foreign policy perspective. Trump is not qualified to be president and commander in chief. Indeed, we are convinced that he would be a dangerous president and would put at risk our country's national security and well-being. Well, <laughs> Donald Trump, in true Donald Trump fashion, um, came right back with a response. But this time, you know, he didn't uh, attack them outright. Instead, he thanked these 50 Republicans for coming out of the woodworks and exposing themselves to the American people. He says, the names on this letter are the ones the American people should look to for answers on why the world is such a mess. And we thank them for coming forward so everyone in the country knows who deserves the blame for making the world such a dangerous place. They are nothing more than the failed Washington elite looking to hold on to their power. And it's time they are held accountable for their actions. Ooh, oh my goodness. So these are not Republicans, mind you. These are statists, just like the never Trumpers who say Trump isn't a true conservative. So we're going to vote for Hillary Clinton because they want to yield that much power, that much more power in years to Hillary Clinton and the Democrats just because they don't like Donald Trump. What does that tell you? They are all so afraid of him. We're going to have more on that later. David Knight is going to be getting to this in depth on these 50 statists who have now come out against Donald Trump. Uh, but we also have some news out of WikiLeaks. They are offering a $20,000 reward for any information that could lead to the murder of a DNC staffer. WikiLeaks said in a tweet that the group is issuing a $20,000 reward for information leading to a conviction in the death of Seth Conrad Rich. Rich was shot multiple times on July 10th. Now, it's being investigated as a robbery, but his wallet, credit cards, and watch were not taken. Um, Mr. Rich was 27 years old. He was shot in the back. Now, some are speculating that Hillary Clinton is behind the murder uh, because Rich could have been the DNC staffer responsible for leaking the 20,000 damaging DNC emails to WikiLeaks. And there are some other allegations that it was uh, powerful Sanders allies who had convinced Rich to leak this data. Now, you know, is this a left-wing conspiracy or is this 
this just more adding to the Clinton body count? Because he's just one of several people involved with some Clinton things in the last se several weeks to die under what would some would call suspicious circumstances. Sean Lucas served the DNC on July 3rd with a complaint and summons in a fraud action on behalf of Sanders supporters. Um, on August 2nd, he was found lying on the bathroom floor dead by his girlfriend. Uh, when she came home that night, his girlfriend said he was in great health, but there now he's found dead on the bathroom floor. And of course, we reported on John Ash, who was the former president of the United Nations General Assembly. He mysteriously passed away June 22nd, just a few days before he was scheduled to testify in some shady financial dealings regarding a former Clinton crony. The United Nations said it was due to a heart attack, but of course the police on the scene said it was that pesky barbell that fell on his neck. Now that's of course in addition to Victor Thorne who wrote four books exposing the Clintons. He reportedly killed himself uh, with a gun on his birthday on August 1st. So of course this is just more people adding to the Clinton body count. I mean, how much smoke does there have to be before you can see a fire? Now stick around, David Knight will be in studio and then joining me, Joe Biggs and Ashley Beckford, we're gonna talk about Hillary needing to disavow her new Taliban fan. Well, the USA Today headline says Republicans turn on Trump. And I think what we need to do is put quotation marks on Republicans. No, this is the GOP establishment, the globalist old party, the elites of the bankers. The same people who run both the Democrat and the Republican Party. USA Today says Donald Trump is facing a rising and unique group of outspoken opponents. They're called Republicans. No, it's establishment Republicans that have lied to the people who have elected them to office time and again. These are the same people who are coming after Trump because they're generally concerned that he's going to do what the people want to do. And they're, they're very concerned that he's going to come after their globalist interests. But Donald Trump struck back today. Yesterday, we had a group of 50 people, all establishment figures, part of the Bush administrations, come out and blast Donald Trump, and he blasted back. This article from Don Salazar on Infowars.com, Trump blasts rhinos who attacked him. He says, they are the ones who allowed the rise of ISIS. And early on the show today, we had Stephen Pachenik, who talked about how these are totally incompetent people. People like Michael Hayden, who, interestingly enough, remember that story a few months ago when he went on a news program with Judge Napolitano and he goes, yeah, like Judge Napolitano, I too am a libertarian. And Napolitano and the host looked at him like, what? what? I mean, that was one of the most bold-faced lies you've ever heard from the guy. The guy who went to Washington and Lee University, as we've shown you the clip many times, and said, I didn't need any order, I didn't need any law to spy on people. I didn't need the Patriot Act. I had a direct order from the President of the United States. You know, that guy who has so much respect for our Constitution that he acts as if we are a dictatorship. That Michael Hayden. Well, there's other people like him who wrote a letter saying that uh, they were convinced that the Oval Office, uh, in the Oval Office, Trump would be the most reckless president in American history. Those are the people who gave us the unconstitutional UN war on drugs, who gave us the Patriot Act, who lied about the Iraq war, who overthrew ISIS and created an arms bazaar for terrorists there, who gave us dragnet surveillance against the Constitution, like Michael Hayden and others. On every one of these issues, and there's many, many more, these are the people who say that Donald Trump is unfit for office, just like the French president who can't control the terrorists that he let into his own country. So as rather than attacking them outright, as Don points out, the Trump campaign instead thanked the 50 Republicans for coming out of the woodwork and exposing themselves to the American people. Let me read to you from this letter that he wrote. It is a masterful letter. He said, the names on this letter are the ones that the American people should look to for answers on why the world is in a mess. And we thank them for coming forward so that everyone in the country knows who deserves the blame for making the world such a dangerous place. They're nothing more than the failed Washington elite looking to hold on to their power. And it's time they should be held accountable for their actions. Those insiders, along with Hillary Clinton, are the owners of the disastrous decisions to invade Iraq, to allow Americans to die in Benghazi. They are the ones who allowed the rise of ISIS. Yet. Despite these failures, they think they're in, entitled to use their favor trading to land taxpayer-funded government contracts and speaking fees. 
It's time we put our foot down, declare our gravy train. The gravy train is over. No longer will crooked Hillary Clinton and the other disasters in Washington get rich at our expense. Instead, I offer a better vision for our country and our foreign policy, one that is not run by a ruling family dynasty. It's an American first vision that stands up to foreign dictators instead of taking money from them, that seeks peace over war, that rebuilds our military and makes other countries pay their fair share for their protection. Together, we will break up the rigged system in Washington, make America safe again. We will make America great again. And you know, to those people who continue to come out in the Republican Party at the top, who come out and say that they're going to support Hillary Clinton, Dan Bongino, who knows her so well because he was a Secret Service agent and he's now running for Congress, came out and said on World Net Daily, he said, are you crazy? Are you crazy? Here's what he had to say. He said, understand that by supporting Hillary Clinton, you're actively contributing to the destruction of the greatest country on earth. This is not a theoretical exercise. You are destroying your kid's economy. You are destroying your kid's health care system. You are destroying your kid's education system. You are destroying any semblance of reality in our court system. You're destroying any sense of getting the government out of your life through this massive overgrowth of government bureaucracy. And you are entrenching another seven years of Barack Obama. Exactly. And yet, when we see that Donald Trump, as he did yesterday, turned his focus to the economy because that's what is really important. As Clinton knew, as his advisor told him, it's the economy, stupid. So he came out and gave a speech yesterday detailing what he would do to change the things that are destroying us, that are holding us down in this economy. So how does the establishment react to that? Well, as we pointed out yesterday, they go through and they start to talk about the rough week that he had last week instead of covering his policies. Or they do what Politico did, talk about his Frankenstein economics. Why is it Frankenstein? Well, it takes a little bit from one party and a little bit from another party. In other words, he does not follow the left-right dichotomy that they dictate that we follow. Now see, if Hillary Clinton were to do this, they would be praising her for being so broad-minded, for incorporating new aspects. But when he does it, they call it a Frankenstein policy. And you get things like this from Politico. Wall Street analysts criticize the speech as vague and reliant on questionable statistics because they don't agree with it. It wasn't vague. He says, my general response is that there's a speech that didn't make an economic plan and most of what he relied on was hyperbole, okay? Let's flesh it out with specifics. Well, yesterday I talked about how specific his health care plan is, how it relies on the free market, on consumer choices, on information to make those consumer choices, but they choose to ignore that. You know, the policy statements that Donald Trump has on his website among all the people who are running, Democrat or Republican, were the most specific. You may not agree with everything they had there, but it was very specific. And you can see how it relies on free market principles. But let's take a quick look as the New American summarizes the plan that Trump laid out yesterday. They say it will cut corporate and personal income tax rates significantly. It'll cut small business income taxes to only 15%. It will make child care expenses tax deductible. It will repeal many more of the outrageous executive orders issued by Obama. It will put a moratorium on new federal regulations that we're getting now at the rate of 80,000 pages a year. It will terminate plans to implement the TPP, as we've talked about, and renegotiate NAFTA. Repeal a special tax break for hedge fund managers. It's called carried interest. It will eliminate the need for corporations to do tax inversions. In other words, these corporations that are going abroad like uh, Google and Apple and others sheltering their income, they would have a reason to come here because it would lower the corporate tax rate from 35 to 15 percent. But it would help the most the small businesses because we know these large businesses are going to find a way that they're not going to pay these taxes. But take a look at some other people besides just people like Michael Hayden. Here's another article from Politico. Former GOP EPA heads endorse Hillary Clinton and say Trump would set the world back decades. Well, let's look at who these guys are. The first one is William Ruckelhaus. Now, this is a guy who was the very first head of the EPA. Okay, He was also, has served for many, many years on the board of Monsanto. How's that for environmental protection? Those of you who understand what Monsanto has been doing. And of course, this is a man who has endorsed Obama in 2007, 2008, and subsequently uh, to that. Then the other person that they're talking about that was an EPA head is William Riley. This is a guy who helped uh, Bush the first push through the Clean Air Act, which was really our first time that we had cap and trade for the environment. He also headed the U.S. delegation to the Earth Summit in Rio, where they're having the Olympics now. That was back in 1992. That was the very first one of these climate summits that has been selling us this fraudulent ideal of climate change being the problem 
and global government being the solution. So these guys, Monsanto people, uh, people who are all about the uh, climate change fraud, these are the individuals who say that Donald Trump couldn't protect the environment. Okay, let's understand where these guys are coming from. As I said before, it is the banker party, the globalists who are running this situation. These are the people that are coming out and they're portraying them as if they were Republicans. Now in the little time that we have left, we see this other story that is now floating about how they are setting up a third podium for the debates. Now, of course, Gary Johnson is uh, doing much better than Jill Stein. She is only at 3.8%, but they say he's doing about 8.8% nationally. That is far below the 15% that was put in to keep out third parties. You understand, the Presidential Debate Commission was set up specifically to keep out any third parties, and they set a very high level of 15% after Ross Perot got into debates. They're now looking at any kind of desperate strategy to keep Donald Trump out. And that's why they're th setting up a third podium in this because the libertarian candidates are nothing but a stalking horse for the big government banking establishment. They have betrayed and ignored the second amendment and private property rights. These two guys are GOP establishment politicians like the 50 who wrote uh, that letter, and they're saying they're going to bend the rules. If they get even close to 15%, they'll let them in. Stay with us, we'll be right back. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. These mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church and the Masonic fraternity. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Alice Bailey, Lucius Trust. Let us pray. Oh God of many names, we know that you call us to work hard to bring people together. Oh God of many names, let us pray. Oh God of many names. What appears to be a simple prayer is actually echoed by New World Order Pope Francis, calling for a new humanity and insisting Christians and Muslims both worship the one God. Michael Snyder writes, Pope Francis told hundreds of thousands of young people gathered for World Youth Day in Poland that they need to believe in a new humanity and that they should refuse to see borders as barriers. In May of 2016, Pope Francis welcomed one of the top Sunni clerics in the world to the Vatican, and he reportedly told the cleric that our meeting is the message. In September of 2015, Pope Francis traveled to New York City to deliver a speech that kicked off a conference during which the United Nations unveiled a new universal agenda for humanity. In November of 2015, Pope Francis declared that fundamentalism, even Christian fundamentalism, is a sickness during remarks in which he stressed the similarity of the major religions. In July of 2015, during a trip to Ecuador, Pope Francis spoke of the need for a new economic and ecological world order in which the wealth of the planet is shared by everyone. Pope Francis also denounced global capitalism and referred to its excesses as the the dung of the devil. In June of 2015, Pope Francis called for a new global political authority that would have the resources necessary to deal with the world's economic problems and injustices. And back in June of 2014, Pope Francis authorized Islamic prayers and readings from the Quran at the Vatican. In ancient times, this would have been considered blasphemy. But today, nobody really even notices when something like this happens. Now combine the New World Order Pope with Hillary's past behavior in the White House. Hillary's potential presidency, when considering the spiritual aspects, should not be ignored. As First Lady, according to Clinton White House FBI liaison Gary Aldrich, Hillary adorned the First Lady Christmas tree in pornographic occultic ornaments two years in a row. In addition, Aldridge and members of the permanent White House staff were repeatedly shocked to discover recent drug use, rampant theft, open gay and lesbian sex, and perhaps most alarming, widespread access to classified materials by personnel without security clearances. But I'm sad to report that uh, when the Clinton administration uh, began, um, two elements that contributed to the dismantling of the security program and created what I've called a mock security program. Specifically, the White House Counsel's Office, led by Bernard Nussbaum and uh, Vince Foster and Bill Kennedy, along with the Chief of Staff, um, at that time, Mac McClarty, 
uh, basically dismantled the security program. They cut the Secret Service out of the loop. They were not allowed to know who was working in the White House. They were not allowed to see the FBI investigations. In addition, they failed to enforce the policy, which has held in the past, for 30 years in fact, that each and every person coming to the White House every day should have a serious background investigation to protect the President and the other uh, issues that I mentioned. Um, the group that uh, had not been fully vetted included the late Vince Foster, who was later found dead in Marcy Park. And for those of you who will say tonight, well, the Clintons knew them, I might ask the question, in view of the endless mistakes and scandals which have plagued this administration, did the Clintons really know them? This is the real Hillary Clinton. The New World Order Pope and an occultic president could spiritually take humanity to levels of morality never before seen. John Bound for Infowars.com. Donald Trump insulted a Gold Star family whose Muslim son died in Iraq fighting for America. This is just more proof that Trump is a raging Islamophobe who hates Muslims. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. You're telling me that out of Trump versus Hillary, it's Trump that Muslims should be angry with. Hillary Clinton voted for the attack on Iraq, a war that led to the deaths of well over 100,000 Muslims. A war that displaced millions of Muslims. Hillary Clinton oversaw the attack on Libya. We came, we saw, we died. <laughs> An act of regime change that led directly to the displacement of over 400,000 Libyans, almost all of them Muslims. Of these, thousands of Muslim refugees have drowned at sea trying to escape the hellhole that Hillary Clinton's policies helped create. Hillary Clinton supported arming jihadist rebels in Syria, a policy that led to a country which is comprised of 90% Muslims being almost completely ruined. Hillary Clinton was responsible for policies that created ISIS. She helped transfer weapons to ISIS. The disastrous, absolutely disastrous uh, intervention uh, in Libya, the destruction of the, uh, the Gaddafi government, uh, which uh, led to the occupation uh, of ISIS, of large segments of uh, that country, uh, weapons flows going over to, to Syria, uh, being pushed, uh, by Hillary Clinton uh, into um, jihadists uh, within Syria, including ISIS. Uh, that's there in those emails. ISIS has killed or displaced tens of thousands of Muslims. So let me get this straight. Donald Trump is a danger to the world and represents a huge threat to Muslims because he called for a temporary restriction on immigration. But Hillary Clinton the individual whose policies led directly to the death and displacement of millions of Muslims is the progressive candidate who Muslims should support. This doesn't even take into account future wars in the Middle East that Hillary will launch. In 2008, Hillary said that she would attack Iran and quote, totally obliterate a country comprised of 75 million Muslims. And I want the Iranians to know that if I'm the president, we will attack Iran. We would be able to totally obliterate them. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall Trump saying he would, quote, totally obliterate any country, never mind one that's 99% Muslim. Hillary Clinton hates Muslims. She's consistently supported policies that ruin Muslim countries, policies that have killed and displaced millions of Muslims. Hillary is clearly a way bigger threat to Muslims than Donald Trump could ever be. Yet all we hear about in the media is how Donald Trump hates Muslims. So Muslims, if you want a president whose policies have wrecked the lives of untold numbers of Muslims, then vote for Hillary Clinton. As a community moves towards despotism, respect is restricted to fewer people. That's veteran Denver police officer Charles Jones IV smashing an unarmed suspect in the face six times. Officers accused of using excessive force on a suspect and then trying to erase the evidence of... I'm observing what they're doing in their room. I don't understand what's going on. 
a community rates low on an information scale, when the press, radio, and other channels of communication are controlled by only a few people. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? How can you ask such a question? What difference at this point does it make? When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in the community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. There are actions I have the legal authority to take as president that will help make our immigration system more fair and more just. Tonight, I'm announcing those actions. What I say goes, see? I'm the law around here. <laughs> you came, you saw, you died. Yes, in modern warfare, our military leaders are finding that words and ideas are highly effective weapons. You just have to be repetitive about this. We need to do this every day of the week and just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. We are trained to deceive if we have to. You really didn't, don't have to trust me. You shouldn't trust me. In fact, by my actually participating in that, I will taint the news. In communities of this kind, despotism stands a good chance. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Help getting this huge. Well, we're, we're going to do everything we can to help you. <laughs> Resistance to tyrants is open. Once again, InfoWars is right there at the top of the Drudge Report with a story that there is no way we are going to allow Hillary Clinton and her bought and paid for media to bury, although they are working overtime to try to make this go away. Will Hillary disavow? Omar Mateen's father was at her rally. This is the father of the gay nightclub mass murdering terrorist. He shows up in full support of Hillary Clinton, standing right behind her in plain view. Um, he's there at her rally in Florida last night. This is a man who openly supports the Taliban. Uh, he's openly called for the extermination of gay people, although he says, you know, let God do that, unless you're in a, a country that practices Sharia law. And then, of course, you can be exterminated if you're gay. Uh, joining me now, Joe Biggs and Ashley Beckford. Now, Biggs, I want to start with you. How likely do you think it is that the Clinton campaign had no idea Omar Mateen's father was there? It's a big old goose egg, 0% chance. They knew what was going on. This was a statement, uh, plain and simple. Uh, think about a billboard, for instance. You don't put a billboard at a cul-de-sac. Put a billboard on an interstate where there's tons of traffic, tons of people going to see what's going on. This was a statement that the Clinton campaign wanted to make. They had him up there, and there's a couple tricks that are going on, too. If you notice, uh, Sadiq Mateen, Omar's father, has a red hat on. So that's kind of like one of those subliminal messages that you see that. Yeah, you're thinking, you know, automatically you're thinking a Trump, thinking a Trump hat, hat or yeah. what. They kind of push that narrative that against the racism and all that. But how can she sit here and say that she's for women, that she's for the LGBT community, knowingly having this person right behind her? I've been to many of these rallies. You don't just walk up there and go, I'd like to be behind the presidential front runner. No, you've got to go through Secret Service three, four days in advance, and you have to be cleared, verified, and all that, and then you get to be there. They bring those people in first, and they bring in the media, then they bring in the large crowd of people or small crowd of people, if we're talking about Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's how it happens. Well, isn't this someone who's been actively working with the FBI, and his son had been under um, FBI's watch for years before this happened, so... Clearly, they must have this guy on their radar, right? And they know that he was showing up to a rally where the potential future president is going to be giving a speech. Well, I would hope that the Secret Service would catch on to something like that, seeing as how his face has been plastered all over TV since his son went out and committed these horrendous right. crimes. There's I mean, no way. And I remember when it first happened, I was like, that guy looks like he's posh toon. I've been to Afghanistan. I know what these guys look like. Come to find out this guy does have a radio TV show that broadcasts to Pashtun Americans and Europeans, mostly in this you know area. And he really pushes this pro-Taliban message that talks about this line that borders Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's this tribal region that's been a really uh, like a battle zone for quite some time between the two uh, types of people that live in that area. So he has these Sharia law uh, mindset that he wants to take out homosexuals, anyone who's against Sharia law. You know, if a woman speaks out of place, you know, slap them around, that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of person that she is allowing to come up on stage with her. That sends out a huge message right. to the American people. Absolutely. The, the 
the Constitution, of course, is underneath Sharia law. And then I love that initially the news crew that spotted him there, they tried to you know, get a statement from him. He didn't want to speak. Well, just by chance, they happened to run into him at a rest stop. And he said, yeah, you know what? I do want to speak to you now. And he pulls out this big sign that he had made, I guess, to put at the rally talking about how uh, she's made the biggest investment since World War II. In investment in what? <laughs> Destroying the Middle East, arming the arming the rebels there who became uh, ISIS. Arming, arming his buddies that yeah. he would like to have brought over here. In, in that <laughs> in, in that clip, security. in that clip, he says something that's really important that people need to pay attention to. He goes, "It's the Democratic Party. Anyone can join." And she was asking, "Why do you think you could be here?" Yeah, he, that's a message right there. Right. Someone called him on that trip from leaving that knowing that he was going to be interviewed and said, you know what, if you're approached by media, you need to say this. That sends out a clear message to these people. Come on in. Yeah, come we'll on take in. you. Right, on, exactly. Arms. I agree with both of you. I think it's way too convenient for them to say that they had no idea that she was behind him. I mean, uh, that he was behind her, rather. And uh, I was wondering when I was looking at this, I was wondering... Does stronger together actually mean that the Democratic Party is stronger with Islamic <laughs> terrorists? In Sharia I mean, law. <laughs> yeah, in Sharia <laughs> law. Because, like you said, <laughs> this guy is clearly pro Taliban. He has a lot of ties uh, with his, um, you know, news organization or his show that he has where he talks all about, you know, uh, being against people who are uh, non Pashtuns. Uh, he has a lot of anti-U.S. rhetoric that he gets into, you know. So there's no way that they weren't aware, um, you know, that he was going to be there. And he goes on to say, I mean, in the past, he's gone ahead and said he's not sure what motivated his son to create uh, this atrocity. Uh, he wants God to, God to punish those involved in homosexuality, like you guys said. And so for someone like that to just magically appear there and, you know, with the subliminal message, of the Trump hat, it's obvious that they've got something going on here where they're right. trying to give a message to people. I'm not sure what it is. Well, he just put out a Facebook video that the alleged gunman's father has often appeared wearing a military uniform and declaring himself the leader of a transitional revolutionary government of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. He claims to have his own intelligence agency and has close ties to U.S. Congress. Right, yeah, we've seen him there with pictures there with close ties to U.S. Congress. And so that's the thing, we see this happening so many times with these attacks. They were under FBI investigation. They knew they were coming. Uh, the FBI, of course, knew that there was going to be a terror attack in, in Dallas, but they didn't warn the people until just a, an hour or so before I mean, think about all up. these people that, that see something. You, you hear that whole saying, see something, say something. But people are f afraid to go and say something about a guy like that because well, he's Muslim. Well, and that's the and other then, thing then, I'm wondering is like, didn't anyone at the rally where she's sitting there talking about, you know, the families that suffered this atrocity, the worst terror attack since 9-11 on U.S. soil, did none of those people there recognize him? Or were they like, oh, welcome. She goes, she goes, we I love you. she goes, I know how many people, families, loved ones and friends are still grieving and we will be with you as you rebuild your lives. Meanwhile, the guy's father yeah. that killed all your buddies is right behind me. She delivered right. that line. Didn't but that remember, Trump's a racist. Yeah. Right. Didn't say anything about a radical Islam or, you know, the oh. radical ideology that led to him slaughtering you, which, by the way, was pushed on him by his father, who just so happens to be standing right behind me. Yeah, that's what I was saying with Alex on the show earlier. How did no one mob this guy? This guy should have been mobbed by media, bystanders, people like... Wait, you're the guy, right? Like, why are you here? He's very recognizable. Like, what are you doing here? Did why? you find like, Omar Mateen's wife? Like, 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 what's going on? Like, we have so many questions. No, nope, complete and total signs. But if you would have showed up at a Trump rally, they would have stoned that. Like, it would have been crazy. People would have been like, hey, exactly. you're the guy who pretty much brought life to one of the most heinous criminals in America right now. Mm -hmm. And you think you could just sit here and nothing's going to happen? Right. And then CNN would have taken it and flipped it all over the place. He, he brings in racist terrorists and blah, 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 blah. And then speaking of Trump, when, you know, everyone's always calling him racist, for weeks they asked him to disavow David Duke when David Duke supposedly came out in support of Donald Trump. So why not the same for Hillary? I'm curious to know what she actually ended up saying when people brought up, hey, Omar Martin's father was there at your rally. Let's see what she said. Every day uh, to keep people healthy. Thank you all. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you all very much. Thank you. 
Wow, I'm surprised she didn't do her normal stall tactic of just laughing at the question for a minute. Right, exactly. <laughs> She thinks everything is really funny. She thinks it's hilarious. She thinks that we won't actually wake up to the things that she's doing. You know, it's very obvious that this was a ploy. This was some sort of tactic, uh, maybe to attack Donald Trump or to let his terrorist buddies know out there, hey, welcome. Yeah. Hashtag part of the Democratic not all Party. Muslims. I think, it was, <laughs> I think it was a message to the media out there that really backs her. Let's see how loyal, loyal you are to the Clinton campaign that you won't that none of them said anything this. that showed complete and total loyalty to Hillary Clinton what she stands for her BS what she's doing her lies and the only people talking about it are us and a few other outlets right not many this should be right. front page of everything this shouldn't just be on Drudge on Infowars this should be getting talked about everywhere on CNN MSNBC Yet no one signs. I agree because it seems to be obvious collusion with Islamic fundamentalists. What do you think? I agree. I absolutely agree. I think you kind of nailed it. That this is a subliminal message. It's like a billboard saying, "Hey, you can commit the greatest terror attack on American soil since 9/11, and your dad can come out and say, well, I don't know where he got these ideas from. Probably not my YouTube channel.'" You know, and you can just roll out, stand behind Hillary Clinton, and she's going to let everyone know on a world stage that we are stronger together. Well, thank you guys so much for your commentary as usual. And thank you guys. We'll see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.